today we've got uh, Matthew Todd from the University of Sydney uh, School of Chemistry. We also have uh, Baden Appleyard, the National Program Director uh, for Osgol. Talking about open access and licensing, how it, uh, what impact it, it has on science and the way we do science. And uh, Matthew, you, as far as I can see, have a whole new way of approaching science that includes open data, but lots, lots more. What are you up to there in the School of Chemistry? Well, I, you know, I think of it as a as the way that maybe science used to be done. <laughs> um, so more. By gentlemen scholars sharing things over port, is that? No. <laughs> I think uh, I think if we want to work quickly and efficiently and make best use of resources. Uh, sharing our data is very important. Sharing our papers, obviously, open access is very important. Open data is very important. Um, the thing we're doing uh, here is trying to show that we can work in a more open source manner in which we share data and ideas and we don't protect our work with patents. So this is not means just the reproducibility of the experiment afterwards, but that the whole experiment kind of happens in the open, is that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah, and that means that you share everything you're doing, and, and, and the advantage there, of course, is that anybody can then uh, join your project and, and give you help and advice. Um, so experts can identify themselves and, and come to your project. So is this happening with any of your research at the moment? Yeah, we just published a, uh, a project on making a, a drug for a neglected tropical disease in a, in a in a, a quick way using an open approach and we had um, a lot of input from uh, industry, uh, perhaps counterintuitively, um, who were able to demonstrate that they could help in a public domain. And at the moment we're running an open source drug discovery project for uh, malaria where we're trying to find new molecules in a kind of patentless arena where anybody can contribute. So this is like Social networking meets science in a big way, where you know we're always warned about the the downsides of you know having everything out in the open. From a you know, uh, you know we warn our kids, watch out, what you do on Facebook will be around and could be seen by anyone. This is taking that whole thing and turning it on its head and saying, yes, there are some things. You know, let's say don't put your schoolies photos uh, on the web for everyone to see, but there are some things like science that uh, actually benefit from having lots of eyeballs on them. Yeah, indeed. I mean, the, the social networking thing is important, but, but crucial to the project is that you're able to, to share uh, the detail, the scientific detail. So the data and your lab notebook and everything. That means that peer review of your work never stops. Um, so your lab notebook is available to the world. If you uh, make a mistake um, or you do your science badly, someone will pick you up on that. Um, so it's a pretty it's a pretty brutal way of doing it and, and your work has to be first rate, otherwise someone's gonna someone's gonna criticize. Mm, but uh, does that mean that you you get less um, acknowledgement for the work that you're doing or how does that work? Oh I don't know. Um, I think uh, it, it works in the way that, that software works. Um, open source software. So, so people know uh, who are driving projects and people know who are the most active and, and who have uh, input the most. Um, I think you develop that sense as a community. Um, certainly uh, anyone who contributes uh, something significant um, will be eligible to be named on resulting publications and, and, and in, in the normal way that happens in science. Um, there's no problem with publishing work that has appeared in the public domain already based on, on, on merit and, and real contribution. Yeah, indeed. Contributions which are trackable and, and, and demonstrable, yes. Mm. There's a social element to this. It sounds like a, you know, not just a new sort of methodology for science, but a, you know, a, a different sort of social approach to it. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting to sort of discuss your ideas in, in the open. Um, particularly in something like drug discovery, where it's useful to um, talk about the fact that you're not quite sure what to do next uh, and what the next best step is. Um, people generally want to help solve problems and to do good. So uh, we, we get advice from people who want to help out and, and make the science happen. Um, the social part is absolutely crucial, yeah. Um, 
we, we, we've got great advice and inputs from people we don't know. Um, so we're not having to rely on our uh, known colleagues and our known network of scientists. We get inputs from people that we don't know. And I think that's a very important advantage of, of going open. So, for example, for those things around malaria and um, the other you know, tropical disease things that you were working on, what's the difference then you know, between this approach and the others? What, uh, what are the difference that you're seeing? Uh, you mean the difference in the way of working? Yeah, well, in the result. I mean, is it easier, faster? What's the, the you know, when oh, you can yeah, have lots yeah. of people working on a big project, on, on a project in a kind of distributed way, what, what's the result? I think the two things are that one is yes, it goes quickly. So you, you see a, an acceleration of what you're doing because inevitably you get good advice from people about where the project should be going and you get inputs, you know, people making molecules and actually doing experiments. So that accelerates things. It's also important that the second thing is that you have oversight. So um, anybody who is well versed in a field or has a great deal of experience can come along and say, well, actually, I think that you're not doing this quite right, or did you consider this more up-to-date approach that you might not have heard of? Um, that kind of oversight mimics a lot of things that are done in pharmaceuticals, for example, where companies have expert scientific advisory boards who come along and criticize and critique projects. Um, essentially, our project is continually going through that process where you have people with a great deal of experience um, guiding what you are doing in the future. Okay. Baden, what do you think from a point of view of the, the flow of information and terms of use of uh, the inputs to these kind of projects? What's what this new approach to open science, what does that mean for the way we approach, you know, the f framework for uh, accessing information? Well, I think it means that we really have to uh, ensure that we have at the front of our mind um, before we enter into these projects, uh, an idea as to how we want to receive the information from a licensing perspective uh, so that we can achieve the ultimate goals at the end of the day of making the results open as well. Uh, preferably it would be great to receive all of this information under uh, either one or a few uh, licenses that contain comparable or compatible conditions and terms uh, because that enables the broadest possible reuse of the material. Uh, so on that basis uh, I see the, the, the linkage uh, between Matt's uh, project and something like Ausgold is, is settling and refining a base set of licenses or single licenses under which everyone can operate. Mm. Yes, because it's open and the idea is to integrate stuff from all over the place. You really want to have the least amount of friction, you know, both from a scientific point of view, social point of view, but from a legal point of view as well about the clarity of what I can do with all of this. Well, the beautiful part about what Matt's doing is uh, the speed with which uh, people are responding and working and if you uh, don't have uh, fairly streamlined open arrangements with regard to licensing, uh, then what typically would happen is significant delay as uh, lawyers uh, begin negotiating uh, fairly unique and restrictive terms times 10 or times 100, however many people are involved or organisations are involved, uh, significant delay and increased costs are occasioned by those frictions that you pointed out. Mm. All right, fascinating subject. If you want to hear more on this, we have a full um, uh, seminar that was uh, given by Matt, and I um, encourage you to go and have a look at that, um, that uh, the full presentation, which has some absolutely marvellous um, insights into tropical diseases and you know, how we can address them. Thanks for that, Matt. Thanks, Baden. My pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. And we'll see you soon. Ta-da.